once again, welcome. We hope that you uh, learned something from uh, our endeavors this evening. I want to thank all the candidates who uh, agreed to show up and who are participating. And of course, I want to thank you for showing up and uh, your interest in politics in the city of Midland um, and uh, your support for the Texas Coalition of Black Democrats Midland County Chapter. And with that, I will turn it back over to Courtney uh, to proceed and start our forum. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, first off, um, thank you all for, again, for uh, joining this stream as we have our first series of candidate interviews uh, for those who are running for city council positions here in Midland, Texas. Uh, thank you for joining the room. Um, Mr. Ross Schumann is our first candidate interview. Uh, everyone else, I'm going to ask that you please mute yourselves uh, on your Zoom. Um, this particular forum will be, uh, this is an interview process that is being recorded uh, so that uh, we can share this with the uh, additional membership, but not in attendance. Um, what we will do is uh, we've given, we've come up with a series of questions. Uh, we sent five prepared statements to each of the candidates uh, for them to uh, prepare a comment. And then we also selected several questions. We've come up with several questions that we'll be asking in addition. So the first thing I wanna do again, welcome Mr. Schumann. And uh, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So if you'll introduce yourself and give us just a short intro. So my name is Ross Schumann. I am a, a uh, oil field worker with a MBA and a PMP certification from Syracuse University. I, you know, grew up in oil and gas, like most of the people who live out here. Of course, I grew up in Central Texas, not in Midland, Odessa. I moved to Midland, Odessa in 2017. I grew up in a small rural community, Dimebox, Texas. Uh, you know, learned to work with everybody that was there, regardless of race, skin color, religion. It didn't matter. You know, we're a small community. You got to come together. You have to work together. Because if you don't, you're limiting yourself so much and who you have to work with. You're already so limited, so you have to be able to work with anybody and everybody that's there. I believe in economic diversity for our city. I believe in economic freedom for our people. I believe in allowing our, our citizens of this city to create business for themselves, to run businesses for themselves, and be able to thrive. And that's what I want to see for each and every individual in our city. Great, great. Well, based on uh, what you just said, uh, your first question uh, is the question um, I'm going to ask you about um, my number five. Without question, oil is the lifeblood of Midland's economy. But what would you do to diversify our economy in the downtimes of the oil industry? So that's a great question. And it's one of the key aspects of my campaign is economic diversity. It's something I've looked at ever since I've come to Midland and got to know that this is something we need to be looking at and being able to maintain our economic dependence from the rest of the world. Midland Odessa is a unique culture, but that culture only exists when we're able to maintain economic dependent, independency. So we have a lot of utilizing the NBC and some other facets of their economic development in order to try to build business, but we know that those, those central planning techniques typically don't work and they typically lead to crony capitalism. They typically lead to individuals benefiting their own selves or the individuals around them. What I want to do, what my, my proposal is, is to create a property developed land in the city. What this will allow us to do, consecutive years, 24 months of consecutive residency within the city, will be allowed to take any amount of land within the city that is currently undeveloped, develop that land, but apply for a 10 year property tax abatement. What this will let them do is have 10 years where they will not pay property taxes on that land. Now that comes with some caveats, of course, back to the city. You must employ a certain amount of your employees must come from the city of Midland, must come from our local population, and you need to be actively improving the property tax valuation of that property. But of course, in the first couple of years, it's undeveloped land. You create a business, it's going to increase the property valuation. That allows the members of our community 
not the city council, not the mayor, not the MBC, not these other entities. This allows the people of our city to have a better chance of dictating what industries come into our city. The second thing I want to do is specific to looking at the same process, but going and finding external industries, whether that be wind and solar, whether that be finance, whether that be banking and technology, or any of those other sectors where they're currently looking to leave areas such as California, Washington, New York, Colorado, due to high costs and looking to find areas to relocate. By utilizing property tax abatements, like we've seen Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio do, by utilizing those programs, what we can do is incentivize those companies to want to move here. We have to remember that it's not about making Midland attractive against California or Colorado, but making Midland attractive against Abilene and San Angelo and Lubbock, who are our most closest competitors, where any potential move is going to be evaluated against those other cities. Hopefully in doing so, what this is going to do is bring in some other industries that will help prop us up during boom and bust cycles, but also giving more power to the people of our city who have lived here and made their lives here, not just external corporations, but the people of our city who have lived and made a life here to be able to create business for themselves and be able to benefit the people of our community. Very good. Uh, and that kind of leads me into the next question that I'll ask you. Um, because in order for us to have new businesses, we have to have solid roads. So the next question is, the city has delayed the execution of the road bond that voters supported in 2017. How do you feel about the city not following the voting mandate of its citizens? So a vote that can be ignored is not a vote, correct? If I can simply ignore the mandate of our voters, what's to say that the mayor can't say, well, I, I don't accept that they elected a new mayor or I don't accept that the city council elected a new city councilman. We must respect the will of our citizens, even if we don't necessarily agree with it. The great thing about Texas is that our state constitution doesn't allow us to go into debt, which is why we have bond measures such as the road bond that you saw, which allows our citizens the ability to select when their taxes will arise in most cases. By having a bond issue that was approved and then not being having those funds be allocated by the city, it is the city basically selling the people that their vote did not matter in this instance. We must ensure that every citizen of our city, regardless of who they are, where they are, what they're doing, knows that when they show up to the polls and they push the button and pull the lever, that their vote does matter. We've seen very low voter turnout in our city, and we need to increase public confidence in our processes, in our systems, to ensure that every citizen has the confidence to walk into the courthouse or their voting polling place and pull the lever, push the button for the candidate or the issues that they feel empowered to do so about. And when we don't, and when we don't look at the issues that they are telling us that they want us to do, which roads are a major issue in our city, everybody knows they're a major issue. We need to continue funding those issues. When we have voters tell us they're willing to get some money to go after those issues, we need to take their word and we need to alleviate the issues that they're telling us exist. Very good. Um, speaking of, of things that the citizens want to talk about, and one of the hot button issues uh, that's facing not only Midland, but not only Texas, but all across the United States, and, and quite frankly, our whole country uh, is COVID-19. So my next question, what do you think is the city's council's role, if any, in fighting COVID-19? So there's a couple things the city council can and should be doing. Number one, the city council needs to be ensuring that the hospital and the medical systems of our city, regardless who they are, have all necessary PPE and proper protective equipment. What they can do is, is you know, what they should have been doing over the years and what we need to do now is create this stockpile of this equipment, of the PPE that's necessary to facilitate our doctors, our nurses, being able to go to work and being safe and not becoming sick themselves. The second thing they can be doing is they can be looking at funding sources external to the city, like the CARES Act, like the Rescue Act, 
like the state, uh, some of the state plans that will help us get funding to pay for overtime measures, to pay for additional staffing levels and other things in the hospital that'll help alleviate some of their concerns, some of their worries. I know we have a lot of staff there that are pulling a lot of hours and they're doing a lot of work and a few extra employees, a few extra nurses, a few extra doctors, a few extra janitorial staff would help a lot in alleviating the burden that's being placed on them in this society. Making sure that they can go to work every day, be well rested, ready to go to work, ready to fight this disease, ready to continue to help our citizens out. What we also need to do is we need to make sure that we provide that equipment to the citizens of our city who are the most vulnerable, being the elderly, being the obese. We see, luckily, a new Regeneron uh, antibody, uh, antibody uh, injection uh, center over in Odessa, which is going to be a great, it's, it's proven to reduce hospitalization rates by 70%. But we need to ensure that anybody in our city who wants a mask, who wants those kind of things, and is an at-risk population, is able to get one. We need to make sure that we're working with our nonprofit organizations to deliver groceries, to deliver prescriptions, to deliver other items to these people so that they can maintain safety in their, in their life and making sure that we are providing some funding to those nonprofits through the city organizations, which we already have uh, ability to do so, and funding those programs so that those people are able to maintain a quality of life and able to maintain, you know, we know that for elderly people, Food, uh, food safety is a major issue. So we need to make sure that they're getting their groceries, that they're able to get food, that they're able to continue to eat, they're not losing weight. And we need to make sure that our obese population or our, our, our populations that have external illnesses are getting ability to take care of themselves. And that that's of course, if they choose to, we need to make sure we respect the rights of every one of our citizens to choose their medical history for themselves. And, but if they need or want those items, we need to make sure that they're available to them. Very good. Uh, the next set of questions will come from our, the rest of our executive uh, committee. Um, the first question, uh, Mr. Love, John Love, our chairman, the next question is yours. Hello, John. Mr. Have Love? You unmute yourself. Are you there? Sorry about that. I, uh, used to this, not used to this Zoom thing. I'm just joking. Um, so you mentioned uh, earlier, sir, uh, about uh, um, on the issue of the road bonds that um, as citizens vote uh, should count. Um, and I was wondering, uh, are you, how do you feel about and are you a supporter of uh, what's happening uh, in this country around the nation um, regarding uh, President uh, Biden and whether or not he uh, is the legitimate president and whether or not he won the election. Uh, so my question is, is uh, uh, do you support the big lie, as it's called, and um, how do you feel about that? So voter security is always going to be an important issue. But as this moment, we have no data that indicates to us that there was fraud at a level that would have overturned the election. Is there some fraud? Some places, yes. There were, there's some proven fraud, but not nearly at a level that's being claimed or that would provide for a, a attempt to overturn election. Secondly, we're past this issue now. We can continue to go down this road, but you know it's, it's important to investigate if there are issues. But it's also important to note that President Biden has been certified the winner of that election, meaning he is for all intents and purposes, the duly elected president of the United States. And there is no means to circumvent or backtrack that decision. Once that has been done, which it was done on January 20th, or I'm sorry, January 6th, and as of course you know, the riots and that occurred in that. Once that is done, once that process has taken place, it is final. And President Biden is the president. Now, there will be an attempt in, in four years and three years from now to, to have another election, and the people will get a chance to speak again. And yes, we need to make sure that the, the voters who go out of the polls do so in a fashion that is secure, that is friendly, that is allowing, you know, to make sure that every voter in the state gets the opportunity to go to the ballot box and place their ballot and place their vote and make sure that their voice is heard. We need to make sure that's done. We need to make sure that no voter is being pushed out of the system. 
but we also have to make sure have to that we I'm sorry, what was that? I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, but we also have to make sure that people understand that what we have right now is we do have a president in the United States that is President Biden at this moment. Now, in three years, we may have another candidate who comes along and wins the presidency. We saw issues with voter registration. We saw issues with voter integrity through 2016, claims from one side, and we saw those same issues occur in 2020. And, you know, for me, a lot of these issues arise from public confidence in our election. And again, we need to make sure that regardless of who the winner is, that we maintain public confidence and public, uh, public accountability of our elections so that people feel like they can go to the polls and have their voices heard and be able to actually make a difference in our country. Very good. Um, Mr. Perkins, are you available? Oh yeah, I, all right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Perkins. Right. I hear you. Okay. Uh, okay. I want to ask. You, uh, I live on the southeast part of town. Yes, sir. And we got streets that need to be repaved or mm -hmm. paved. And uh, uh, would you help try to get that done? And then this, if you are elected. So uh, let me address that for the entire city. I have a project management certification and part of project management is building a solid foundation. I think it's great that the city wants to spend some money on things like new fields and new lights and new turf. But if you, if you cannot build the attic of a house before you build the foundation to the house, our roads are, and our infrastructure, such as our water supply, our sewer, our drainage, we saw drainage become a big issue just a few weeks ago in this city where we're not shedding water adequately when we get the rain. So we need to make sure that all of those systems, whether it be sewer, water, roads, or drainage, are adequately and fully taken care of and addressed in the city before we go looking to spend money on externalities and before we start going looking to spend money on luxuries. It's great to have some of these things. And I perfectly agree that we should be looking to do those things, but we must ensure that we build the foundation of our house before we start building the roof. And part of that is going to be looking at the roads in our city and ensuring that they are taken care of throughout the entirety of the city. Every part of the city needs to be taken care of because if we wanna talk about economic development, these people don't wanna bring businesses into a town where they're gonna lose an axle in their vehicle trying to drive through. Very fair. Um, and our final question is gonna come again from our chairman, Mr. Love. Mr. Love? Yeah. Hey, I'm still trying to get my questions or up. <laughs> I don't have them up. Give me just a second. I think I have them right here. All right, here we go. Um, okay. How do you feel about the um, proposed attempts to put forth a uh, a police commission that is uh, has members of the community. Um, and second part of the question, uh, will you support uh, policy training that teaches uh, de-escalation tactics uh, with the Midland Police Department? So I do support that, but my policy actually takes it a step further. My policy is called community accountability of policing. Another one of the tenets of my campaign is equal application of policing. It shouldn't matter who we are, right? We should, that when we are in interacting with a cop, that we are all treated equally by that cop, whether it be me, be you, be anybody else in the city. We all must have equal interactions with the police for whatever we're being stopped for, being told to do. What we must make sure of is that our cops are made are held accountable by the people ability of policing act does allow any member of the city to raise a petition, get 15% of the signatures of the electorate within the city, which is not a small amount, but it's not undoable either. If you can raise those elected those electorates, what it'll do is it'll put that cops position with our police department to a ballot initiative. If the ballot initiative fails, the police officer stays. If the ballot initiative passes with a simple majority, the police officer must be removed by, by, the, by the city. Now, that doesn't alleviate the city council, the mayor, the, uh, the, the city manager, or any other issues from being able to remove a police officer. Now, 
I, I, I understand that this doesn't mean that every police officer that does something bad will be removed. But what I do think this will do is it'll help increase accountability, help increase transparency, help increase public trust in our police officers. We know that there are a small number of officers who are disobeying the law, who are abusing their power and are doing things that they should not be doing even within our community. And we need to make sure that at any given time, the people of our city, whether that be you, me, or anybody else, are able to hold those police officers accountable and able to raise the issue to their, to their peers within the city and allow for that to be transparent and accountable to all members of the city. Very good. Mr. Schumann, we certainly appreciate your time in answering these questions for us. And um, we wish you all the best in your, your campaign moving forward. Uh, know that we are looking to host a, a, a forum uh, sometime in October, and we'll definitely be in touch with your campaign as uh, those dates come closer and we, we finalize something. Um, finally, I have about a minute uh, for you left. Uh, do you have any final comments for us? So my, my final comment is going to be that, you know, Midland has a lot of good things going for it, but it's not perfect, and there's always room to improve. Any city who thinks they have everything taken care of, that there's nothing left to build, or if it's not broke, you shouldn't fix it. You know, Henry Ford said when he went to build the car that he shouldn't have ever built a car. He should have just built a faster horse. So we know that just because something is working today and working for the majority of people doesn't mean it's working for everybody. And we can look to continue to build the city so that everybody prospers and that everybody has an equal opportunity to go out and gain a life for themselves, whether that be an oil and gas, whether that be creating their own business, or whether that be serving in the community. We need to make sure that the people of our city are able to have the freedom to go do the things that they see fit and be able to live their lives the way they want to, whether that means going to church, where they send their kids to school, or how they, or how they live. All of these things, we must ensure that the rights of our citizens are protected at all costs. Excellent. Mr. Schumann, again, thank you for your time and uh, best wishes and we'll be in contact in the future. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Gentlemen, thank you for your questions. It truly is a pleasure to speak with you and I hope we get an opportunity to work together in the future. All right, and so that includes, uh, concludes our interview with Mr.